for tonight, both the soloist and the conductor. So I'd like to welcome to the stage uh, Rachel Barton Pine and her famous Guarnieri violin, as well as, uh, <laughs> as, uh, as, well as the uh, Fozzie Heimer, uh, our uh, wonderful conductor for the evening. And you're in for a tweet. It's a great concert. I heard the rehearsal. So please welcome them. Thank you. So you can take the middle, middle seat or whatever it is. I'm used to having the conductor on my left. Well, that's true. Good point. <laughs> and I'm going to be here. Uh, would you prefer the other chairs that better for playing in case? Oh, uh, this is fine. Okay. I can move too. Yeah. So it's great to be back in Albuquerque. I can't, I can't even count up how many times, but I know it's been about 20 years that I've been coming down here. So always well, a pleasure. We feel very fortunate to have you. <laughs> and not only her, she comes with this wonderful little girl that's just adorable. And I, I hope you get to meet her at the intermission sometime. <laughs> Yeah, so before I talk about the Beethoven, I want to say a couple of quick things. Um, first of all, I'm sure you're all very aware of the Young Musicians Initiative that the Philharmonic is involved in, um, bringing um, music lessons and instruments to elementary school children in some of the inner city schools. And I was very happy to have the opportunity to work with some of these kids on Thursday, and it was so inspiring and such wonderful young people, and so great to see the enthusiasm that my colleagues in the orchestra have for this effort. So bravo to all of you. It's wonderful to see this happening you, in your community. Thank you. And also, you know, people like me who play the violin and go around doing concertos, you know, we're basically in a different city or country every week, and sometimes we return to an orchestra, sometimes we visit a new orchestra for the first time, sometimes there's the conductor is a music director, sometimes it's a guest conductor. Um, you know, you get to meet new friends and say hi to old ones, and in this particular case, it's a very funny story, because I was booked um, as an old friend of the New Mexico Philharmonic, and Maestro Fauci Heimor was booked as a new um, conductor here with the orchestra, and they had no idea that the two of us already had worked together before. Complete coincidence. <laughs> so total this is surprise. A this is a total reunion. Um, we last collaborated about two years ago yeah, or so that, yeah. um, with the Alabama Symphony, um, and so it's wonderful to pick up where we left off, and um, I just love making music not only with these guys, but with him as well, so it's going to be a great show. And I got to so. say, I mean, I'm with you on this one. I absolutely love Rachel. She's really amazing. <laughs> Oh, thank you. So anyway, Beethoven Concerto, one of, one of our old friends, considered to be one of the greatest concertos in existence. Um, not only one of the greatest, but also one of the favorite. I guess those two things go hand in hand. Um, but when it was first written, um, kind of didn't catch on, either by audiences or violinists. It was really ahead of its time and yet old-fashioned at the same time. Ahead of its time in terms of the way that it's structured, um, the use of the violin as not necessarily the star of the show, but really the first among equals in a very collaborative role with the other musicians on stage, where the orchestra sections or different wind players and so on, they often have the melodies. The soloist doesn't get to hog them all, and the soloist often plays descant over those melodies, which is absolutely glorious. It's like chamber music except played by a whole symphony, uh, which is actually more artistically satisfying than just some, some piece where the orchestra was in the role of backup band. But soloists of the 19th century wanted to be the most important person on stage, and so they didn't appreciate the orchestra getting any of the, their melodies. And so they didn't want to play this piece. It languished for quite a while after its premiere. And by the way, the use of the violin is not your crash and burn muscular type of virtuosity where you're 
flying all over the fingerboard and digging into the G-string and all of that good stuff. That's certainly fun to play and fun to hear, but this one is much more of a lyrical soprano type use of the violin. Almost no double stops, if you'll notice, in Beethoven's violin part to his concerto. A few in the last movement, that's about it. And a lots of high, delicate E-string playing. Um, makes it particularly difficult because you have to be absolutely pure. You can't just schmaltz all over things. You'd better be clean and in tune. Um, so it's notorious for needing a lot of practice time to get it good enough to perform. Um, but that kind of playing was characteristic of the violinist for whom Beethoven wrote it, the Austrian concertmaster Franz Clement, who had written his own concerto one year earlier, very similar to Beethoven's, that Beethoven actually used as a boilerplate, more or less. And so this concerto from 1806, written in homage to to Clement and his concerto, um, was really a type of playing that people were moving away from. They didn't want this this elegant, um, delicate violin playing. They wanted violinists to go out there and dig in with all of the gutsiness of the instrument. Kind of like if you think of Beethoven's Kreutzer Sonata, the Sonata Number no. 9, which was actually written for the Afro-European virtuoso George Bridgetower, who was very much a Sturmundrang player. Um, it has all of those kinds of things. and. If he had written a concerto for Bridge Tower and a sonata for Clement, we would have had two very different pieces. So here's the funny part. Beethoven thought that his concerto was never going to see the light of day and was going to be lost to the dust of time. Um, he didn't live long enough to see its revival by Joseph Joachim. Um, and so Beethoven decided, well, I don't want it to be completely lost. I'll transcribe it into a piano concerto. Well, it's a pretty odd piano concerto. You'll have to check it out. See if you can find it on YouTube or something. It's got to be on there. It's really quite, I mean, of course, we can't divorce our ears from knowing that it's a violin concerto, so we're not listening objectively, but come on, compared to his real piano concertos, it's a little bit like, really, Beethoven? Um, <laughs> but what's interesting is that Beethoven did not write cadenzas, those solos where the orchestra stops playing and the violinist gets to do kind of their own fantasy on themes from the movement. He did not write those for the violin concerto concerto, assuming that the violinists would write their own. But he did write them for the piano concerto version of the violin concerto. And so I'll just show you the interesting thing. Um, basically, you know, Beethoven's solo part after the long opening tutti starts with these famous broken octaves. Now, most of the cadenzas that have ever been written by all of those dead guys from the late 19th and early 20th century, like Chrysler and Heifetz and Joachim, et cetera, et cetera, start with their own version of some broken octaves. That's the Chrysler version. But Beethoven did something totally different with his piano concerto cadenza. He starts with the tutti blast that the violinist actually never plays or plays over in any of the solo sections. And you know what? That's just so fun to get to do. I couldn't resist. So that's how I start my violin cadenza. And then I go off in a different direction because the piano cadenza doesn't really work as a translation. Um, but I do steal his idea for how to start his cadenza. Um, the other element I should mention is the use of the timpani, kind of a heartbeat. Four timpani notes are how the whole concerto starts. How odd is that? We're used to it now, but think about it. That was sort of bizarre, and it kind of still is if you think about it. So these four timpani notes, bum, 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 and that rhythmic thing is often used even by different of the instruments melodically you know, throughout the first movement. So I do a lot of playing around with that in my cadenza, and I even sneakily bring it back in the cadenza of my last movement, just because I can't resist. So you'll have to be on the lookout for that. Um, yeah, so basically, uh, what now I talked about the violin playing over the orchestra melodies. Probably the most fascinating use of that is in this, the beautiful second movement. There's almost this um, hymn-like theme, almost like you're in the distance listening to something coming out of an abbey or something, and almost like the violinist is just musically commenting on it and plays a different thing every single time that same theme um, reappears, and it's... It's just miraculous the variety of ways that Beethoven is able to play with these simple but profound melodies. Thank you so much, Rachel. I don't know if you want to join us for the rest of the pre-concert talk. I know that you 
you um, usually warm up? Uh, well, I already did my hair, okay. so... Okay, uh, <laughs> great. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question, quick question. So is your cadenza, you wrote it, and is that available? Is it published, uh, like if a student or somebody else would like to... Yeah, it. I think actually we probably have a few in my merch suitcase, I'm not sure. Um, but I did publish all of my cadenzas and my different, um, you know, encore virtuoso pieces and arrangements and all of that good stuff um, in a collection for Carl Fisher. And it's actually a great honor because I'm the only alive person in their series. <laughs> and I'm actually the only female as well. So. Um, Wonderful. Well. You know, I always, I always am very flattered and, and excited when somebody decides to play one of my cadenzas. But more importantly, I think having the example out there that this is this art of writing your own stuff for your instrument is not something that people used to do, but that even performers today can still carry on this old tradition. Is some, the word I really want to spread to young artists out there and students coming up. And the most excited I get is when a young person says to me that they were um, motivated to write their own cadenza because they saw that I had done mine. Uh, and really, doing your own is the most organic reflection of your thoughts about the piece. So, Thank you so much, uh, Rachel. Please give a one, <laughs> wonderful round of applause for this. Thank you so much. I would like to uh, move a little bit to Fauzi about the um, sy symphony, the organ symphony, if you would like to uh, tell us your experience with that. Sure. Uh, you know, I guess perhaps... One way that I can start before we even talk about the symphony itself is talk about this program in general. I mean, this, this program is deeply rooted in uh, romanticism. I mean, right, right in the core of it, uh, you know, Beethoven being the earlier of the, of the three, but then you have the Brahms, which I'll talk, uh, you know, a little bit uh, about it. Um, that's towards the 1880s, and, and same with, with the Saint-Saëns, actually. Uh, so we're, we're, we're deeply rooted in the 19th century here, um, and three really amazing pieces, uh, and, and, you know, Rachel spoke about the Beethoven already. Now, the Brahms uh, is, is something unusual. Uh, it, it, with, when he wrote this piece, it was simply a, a, his dissertation, actually, if you think about it. He was given an honorary doctorate uh, at the University of Breslau, and, and they asked him, you know, well, actually, the first thing that happened is that he sent a letter and said, thanks, and that was it. It was, thank you very much, and I appreciate it. And then they said, no, 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 wait a second. You have to do something for us. Um, and so he, he said, okay, well, well, you know, what do you want me to do? He said, well, you're a composer, so, you know, write us a symphony. <laughs> and they said, well, okay, uh, you know, I'll, I'll get to work on it. And so he started writing, then he wrote this, the Academic Festival Overture, uh, instead. Um, it, it, and the reason being is that he was always a joker. The guy, he, he loved to joke around. And even when you hear the piece in its simplicity, especially in the beginning, you'll notice the lightness, the bumpy uh, nature of the work. Um, it's really quite a joke. I mean, uh, you know, he even referenced to the fact that there are those, you know, our drinking buddies in, in college. I mean, there, it did happen back then as well. Um, and sure enough, it, the same thing, you'll, you'll hear it with the, in the Brahms. I mean, it very much is a lighthearted piece. Um, but then, it, it just so happens that it has to be one of his biggest compositions orchestrally. I mean, the instrumentation is, is magnificent, and it's very, very big. Um, and again, that was the joke. I mean, he said, I'm going to write you a 10-minute piece, and I want you to use pretty much every single musician in your, in your music department. So, I mean, you're going to see when we open up the, the concert just a ton of people on stage for, uh, for 10 minutes. And thankfully with the Saint-Saëns, we, we use them as well. Um, but nonetheless, this piece is huge and is a joke after all, but it is a magnificent uh, composition. And it's a really, really great piece. It's very effective and is performed all the time now, all over the world. Um, and uh, if you haven't heard it before, uh, I'm sure you will enjoy it. And if you have, well, welcome back. You'll, you'll like it again, especially with this group of musicians. I mean, you have an amazing orchestra here, ladies and gentlemen, I have to say. And then, and then we come to the latter part of the, of the concert, the, the Saint-Saëns. Now, this piece uh, is really remarkable in the sense that it tries things that are completely different than what he as a composer did, but also what others have done, but yet he manages to take ideas from various different composers that, that, that influenced him, Franz Liszt being one of them. That's the famous composer um, that, uh, that has a connection with, with the, uh, the Third Symphony. However, we actually need to tie this into Beethoven a little bit. The symphony in itself 
uh, contains various different types of and uh, thematic material, but Beethoven mastered this type of cyclicism, the transformation of the thematic material throughout various different movements within one work. And so Saint-Saëns does the same thing. He takes this very simple melody, right, and he transforms it, as Franz Liszt would, by the way, but, but uh, certainly as Beethoven would, takes this melody and transforms it into various different forms throughout this two-movement work. Uh, some people say it's, it's four smaller movements, but rather uh, two big movements, so I'm just going to refer to it as two big movements. Um, but nonetheless, you, as you listen to the work, uh, this, you know, oh, 35, 40 minute uh, uh, symphony, try to see if you can latch on to the thematic material right in the beginning. It starts off with strings and then it gets transferred into the woodwinds and the brass eventually take it over. But then as, as we go into the slow segment of the first movement, try to see if you could hear that melody but yet sound a little bit different. And Beethoven mastered that, right? And so he influenced, Beethoven that is, influenced everybody else um, as far as cyclicism. Now, the other thing that I, I find really important about this piece, again, referring back to Beethoven, is that Beethoven ha was a master at uh, the whole art form of, of, of good versus evil, you know, where he starts off in a very dark fashion, but yet connects an entire symphony by starting dark and then ending in a very glorious manner. Um, and again, that's the same thing that Saint-Saëns does with, uh, with the organ symphony. You start off with this very, in a very dark nature, and then, and then the strings, even in, in a very Mendelssohnian type of way, even uh, much, much like the Schubert Unfinished, you'll notice it's very, very dark. Exactly exactly the way they play, very little bow, and then the woodwinds come in with a with rather minor key. But yet somehow we have to find a way in 35 minutes to get to the good side rather than the dark side. And he does it magnificently. But it's, it's certainly noticeable right towards the end, of course, of the symphony where this, this is a just magnificent C major appearance. Um, and C, B, C major being the key of perfection, right? No sharps, no flats. And so the organ just explodes. And, and you know, now that you're all here, I'll let you into a little secret. You'll notice, for those that are not familiar, everybody's going to jump up from their seat and because it's going to be like an explosion. And you will not notice it. But now that I'm telling you, you'll be like, oh, I, I knew that. I'm, it's okay. Did you see that guy? He jumped up. He didn't know. I know this piece. But, but nonetheless, um, you know, it, it really has this amazing uh, appearance with the organ. Now, it's not the first time. It's the second time. The organ appears twice. But that C major is just the culmination of this entire work, right, coming to the very end. And he picked C major. Again, it's the key of perfection. So we go towards the end of the symphony uh, with the organ and then the strings. And again, try to latch on to that thematic material that you've heard into the beginning that was dark but then ends in a much more glorious fashion, it's very majestic, uh, and with the brass and, and, and the orchestra all coming together with the organ. It's just a really magnificent work. And, um, you know, it's, it's not easy to play this piece by any means. And, uh, and like I said, our, the musicians have been doing a really great job. It's been a great pleasure working with them, and, uh, and we certainly hope you enjoy the concert. I think it's going to be fantastic. Thank you so much, Fuzzy. So I'm thinking maybe at this time we'll take a few questions from the audience, if that's okay with both of you. Sure. Yeah, okay. So um, we have a question right here. Congratulations for helping the El Sistema program. So Ooh. do you want to repeat the question? Okay, well, the second question was, who are my favorite violinists today? I don't usually get asked that question. I usually get asked, who are, who's my favorite violinist? And I always say Maud Powell. Um, she lived from 1867 to 1920, was America's first internationally acclaimed violin virtuoso. Um, during her lifetime was considered to be the greatest American violinist of either gender, the greatest woman violinist in the world. She premiered the Dvorak, Tchaikovsky, and Sibelius concertos in the U.S., was the first woman to lead a string quartet where men sat in the other chairs. Um, she was the first artist to actively engage in what we now call outreach, 
um, in, on her days off between big concerts in big cities, she would find some small town halfway in between that had never had a classical concert and introduce the audience to classical music. She was explaining how to listen to it. Um, she was also the first white artist of any instrument to champion the works of black composers. She also championed women composers. She was the Victor Talking Machine Company's first instrumental recording star for which she won a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Grammys two years ago, which was actually made her the first woman instrumentalist of any genre to do so. Um, still breaking ground all these years later. So, yeah, the value, not only her great artistry, but the values by which she lived her life using music as a way to serve, um, to serve younger musicians, to serve the cause of music, to serve humanity, um, is, I just try my best to follow in her footsteps. As far as today's living violinists, it's so hard to listen to anybody without, you know, kind of analyzing. Um, because it's like, I love this person's vibrato, but maybe not their staccato, or I love this person's Beethoven, but not their Tchaikovsky, so how can you have a favorite? Backstage just now, I was listening to a little Metallica, so... Um, <laughs> but, Good choice. Um, but I, I admire and love many, many violinists, but I just listened to the whole array. Um, anyhow, as far as why I started, I saw some middle school age girls playing in my church when I was three and I just loved the sound and I begged my parents for lessons and luckily there was a teacher in the neighborhood and I had the chance to start and I've been obsessed by it ever since. Thank you, thank you. Okay, we have a question there? Um, yes. So uh, the, there are very few holes that have uh, the pipe organ, and how do we compensate for that? And I'm sorry to tell you that the answer is electronics. We it's have <laughs> an organ and, uh, um, that's an electronic, electric organ, and it, we have the, those big speakers that you will hear, and they mimic quite closely the sound of the uh, pipe organ. And uh, I'm just hoping that in the future, whenever people build concert halls or performance halls, they are gonna think about putting an organ in, because first of all, it looks amazing to have an organ, and just to have that tool at your fingertips is just a, um, a treat, so thank you for the question. Um, I guess to either of the uh, um, interviewees, uh, um, I was wondering if, uh, in preparing a concerto in terms of, say, tempi, intonation, whatever, who ultimately calls the shots? And um, <laughs> d does, it, does it matter whether the soloist is, say, a recent graduate? I love that question. Yeah, so who calls question. the shots? Am I doing it his way or is he doing it my way? Um, so, First of all, there, before the first rehearsal with orchestra, there's always a separate conductor-soloist meeting uh, where I'll generally play the entire concerto through, sometimes skipping sections if they're basically repeated material. Um, and well, We talked about our kids, I thought. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, and it's, first of all, it's not just a question of you know, working out any disagreements. It's also because if the conductor is following me and then the orchestra is following him, there's going to be a lag. So the conductor actually has to, he, he or she has the responsibility of knowing what I'm going to do so that they can anticipate my interpretation. And that's not easy if they have their last 10 violinists' interpretations still in their memory. It's not like a symphony where they can do it their way. So it is a bit challenging. I, on, on the other hand, have the responsibility of actually doing on stage what I said I was going to do so that I don't throw him or her for a loop. Um, now, in the rare case that there is a disagreement, it's pretty easily resolved if one of us clearly outranks the other. Um, if it's a really famous conductor, I might, okay, I'm gonna try something new. If it's a you know, young conductor, they're probably gonna just do it my way. But um, on the other hand, it's really useful to be open-minded and try different things. And actually, if the conductor disagrees with you, the onus is on you to not just say, well, that's the way I like to do it but to come up with an actual intelligent justification for why you feel that this is the best way for the music for you right now. And if you can't come up with a justification, maybe they've got a point. There was one case where the conductor and I could not agree at all. It was the Sibelius Violin Concerto. I won't tell you the orchestra or the conductor. Um, but neither of us was, like, more famous than the other, so, like, you know... 
neither, and neither of us would budge. I hated his way, and he apparently felt the same. Um, it was the Sibelius last movement, and I like to do it really, what I consider to be Scandinavian, kind of edgy, you know, at the front side of the beat. He was coming from much more of a Germanic type of approach, very broad. Um, so basically what ended up happening is that during the solo sections, I played it my way, and he courteously followed me. And then you got to the tooties, and they suddenly turned into Bruckner. And it was <laughs> the most bizarre performance you've ever heard. We got a terrible review, and rightly so. <laughs> Fazi, I see you're wanting to chip in. <laughs> Oh boy! I guess that was a really good All question. Right. So I uh, know. Well, you know, the the thing, the interesting thing. I just want to add on to uh, onto your question. You know, to add on top of that, uh, it really does matter who you're working with. As Rachel was saying, I mean, we've worked together before. I mean, we've spent time. We know. We know our. You know, our families. You know, we we know each other well. And uh, so I, I know how she plays, and and I love how she plays. I mean, to answer your question about living violinist, I mean, she's one of my favorites. Um, and, you know, the truth of the matter is it really depends, there is, there has to be a certain type of chemistry, you know, for it to actually work. Um, and, you know, we have that, and, and it was just, uh, like I said, when we worked together, uh, when we talked about it before, you know, before the rehearsal, we really did, you know, we did a little bit of music, I think, but we also talked about the past and how things are going, and that actually also helps, because the whole thing's a collaboration, and she does actually make it quite easy. So, you know, it's add on to your question a little bit. Thank you. We have time for one more question and a short answer. Um, Hillary, what do you think it will take to get a younger audience to come to classical music? At the current rate, in 25 years, you have an empty hall to play to. You know what? People were saying that 25 years ago, and they were saying that 50 years ago, and they were saying that 75 years ago, and yet here we still are. And I heard even in Brahms' time they were talking about that. Um, there's a wonderful quote. The, um, the death of classical music is one of its um, longest living prophecies. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Um, but nonetheless, um, you know, even if every single concert was sold out with a waiting list, we, the onus would still be on us musicians to bring our music to as many new people discovering classical as we possibly could. It's not just about keeping classical music alive for our livelihoods to continue to exist. The, the motivation is not selfish. The motivation is the fact that we're here to serve this great art, that we believe that this art elevates humanity and, and you know, uplifts our spirits. And going and doing all of the things that I do, whether it's appearing on a rock station or going to the local pub and playing for people, going into the the schools and educating children, all of these activities would take place regardless of how the statisticians are cutting the data about the audience of, of the present and future. That's kind of irrelevant to the mission. The mission is to bring this wonderful music to as many people as we possibly can. And, you know, if I can just add on to that, both Rachel and I, as well as our members of the orchestra, appreciate your support. We are here to play for you, so we can't thank you enough for being here and enjoying the music. We really do. Absolutely. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Fauzi. Thank you very much, Rachel. And thank you to you for supporting us for five years. And I look forward to seeing you in the fall at the opening concert on November 12th.